Okay. And, and welcome uh, to nuns and uh, doubters uh, to our group. Uh, as you noticed in the news lately, that we are getting more and more people who are not really affiliated with any religion. And uh, we'd, we welcome you. And uh, how many new people here that have never been here before? Uh, let's see a show of hands. OK, good. OK, well, today we're going to be uh, learning a little more about our desert, uh, the, the Gila monsters uh, in our midst, and the population ecology at Suaro National Park and in and around it. Uh, Kevin Bonin will be our speaker today. Uh, he's recognized as an outstanding um, professor at the University of Arizona uh, in ecology and evolutionary biology, and also at the School of uh, natural Resources and Environmental uh, Science. Uh, he's recognized not only by his peers, but his students. I have it on good authority that his students just admire him. So uh, I think we're in for a treat today. Um, he, you know he's intelligent because he also uh, married uh, a science uh, uh, professor as well. So I think uh, it's quite a family that he has there. So. His classes are basically on the disease ecology of tree frogs, uh, population genetics, uh, the desert tortoise, and um, the population ecology of the Gila monsters. And he and his friend will be uh, here today to talk about the, the Gila monster uh, uh, population in the, in the desert. Uh, he's, he's specialized, of course, in reptiles and amphibians. Uh, he's recently led an experimental education program in Mexico and Peru. Uh, he has a BA and a, a BS from the University of Arizona and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he's been active in the Sonoran Desert Museum, Suaro National Park, uh, Intercultural Center for Study of uh, Deserts and Oceans. And knowing now what he's been doing with his life, I realized I had a lot of problems getting uh, feedback from him. He, I waited and waited and at times to get information back from him. And uh, it turns out that I know now why. He was very busy. And uh, so he's, uh, he's really followed through, though, and given me the information that we really needed. Um, he's um, going to now discuss the uh, Gila monster population and the other activities that are in the, in the uh, park area. So let's give uh, Kevin a real big hand. Kevin Bonin, please. Well, good morning, folks. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to come visit. And uh, you should applaud your program chair for his um, polite persistence about getting the information that he needs. But it is a pleasure to come speak with you. And it's with some strong emotion that I'm here today because this is my father pictured here on my laptop. He died in this hospital 10 months ago today. So it's a little bit, um, some strong emotions today. But I am uh, very pleased to be here with you today. I'm looking forward to talking with you a little bit about some of the research that we're doing and I want to give you some context for that because I'm guessing most of you are not herpetologists. Um, I think what you do as an organization, let me just spend a couple minutes speaking to that. You know, one of the things I try and get across in my classes is the importance of evidence-based decision making and um, how science works and that sort of thing. And so I'm always happy to have an audience that um, agrees with, with that line of thinking. So again, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to meet with you. Uh, as far as <clears throat> thanking some folks, we have lots of supporters, both in terms of research assistance, dollars, those sorts of things. Friends of Saguaro National Park, Saguaro National Park uh, supports some of the efforts of Saguaro National Park, from uh, pulling invasive buffalo grass to research projects, and um, they've been very supportive, as has the Park Service. We've also gotten some funding from the Desert Southwest Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit which helps pair up uh, federal agencies and the Park Service. And uh, obviously the University of Arizona, I'm in the College of Science with an adjunct appointment as well in 
the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and everyone's been uh, wonderfully supportive. My position on campus, I get paid to teach, and the research that I do is kind of on the side. So um, with that brief introduction about me, let's talk a little bit about this guy. And Gila monsters tend to evoke some strong emotions, be they good or bad. I think a lot of folks would agree that they are a fairly iconic member of our resident community. There are some wonderful quotes out there if you go looking. Here's a quote from uh, 1899 from a physician in Phoenix. I have never been called to attend a case of Gila monster bite and I don't want to be. I think a man who was fool enough to get bitten by a Gila monster ought to die. The creature is so sluggish and slow of movement that the victim of its bite is compelled to help largely in order to get bitten. <laughs> and I would agree that there is some truth to that because um, they, they can't chase you down. Um, if you pick them up, they, before you pick them up, they will let you know vehemently that they're not interested in being picked up. So you have to be ignoring their hissing warnings and gaping warnings and that kind of stuff. There was an individual who was bitten uh, at the park a few years ago. I didn't meet the individual, but I was told he had a, a few mental deficiencies himself. But he was trying to get a picture of a Gila monster wrapped around his shoulders. <laughs> and he ended up getting bit on the neck. And um, from what I hear, it is extremely painful. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. There are some myths out there that I don't expect this group to believe. but. Um, are, are kind of fun nonetheless. Gila monsters are venomous and just all kinds of upset because they don't have an anus and all that stuff went bad in there. Okay, not true. Um, once they bite down, they can't let go until sundown. Well, it kind of depends on when you get bit, I guess. Uh, if one bites you, don't worry. It has to turn upside down to get the venom in you. That's just ridiculous. Um, it's true that they don't have the same venom delivery system of a rattlesnake, but um, the animal that I brought with me today that I'm going to show you after I speak, which is a, a reason to stay around perhaps, um, he gaped and hissed at me and splattered some saliva on the glass of his cage, and that saliva is filled with venom. And they don't have an injection system, but if they make a wound, that stuff gets in you, and it's instantly painful. Again, from what I hear, I have not been bitten. Arizona was very progressive, and I say that seriously. Um, <laughs> in 1952, the Gila monster became the first venomous animal in North America to be afforded legal protection, which is pretty neat. So let's take a step back, and let's talk about studying reptiles and amphibians why it's interesting, why people do it, why they're grouped together. So herpetology is a study of crawling things, and it comprises two large groups, the reptiles and the amphibians. The word amphibian means double life. The word reptile means to creep. And people who are labeled herpetologists sometimes get a bad rap, sometimes deservedly so. Here's a gentleman that's so engrossed in his um, Tinosaurs in Costa Rica that he doesn't even have a hand for his beer. <laughs> now, if you take a look at the a reproduction of the history of the tetrapods, so these are uh, land vertebrates. They rose from the fishes, if you look here at node 3, going on half a billion years ago. And then you have a division. Well, let me go back to this one. Okay, and you have your amphibians, you have all of your reptiles here. That includes uh, dinosaurs, which are mostly extinct. The birds made it through that uh, extinction boundary 65 million years ago. But nestled within this group is the mammals. Okay, and the birds are also technically reptiles. But amphibians and this other group, the amniotes, because of the structure of their egg, have not shared a common ancestor for about 340 million years. So there's a lot of diversity um, out there and among these different groups. One of the groups that branched off from an early reptile is the mammals. 
So re reptiles are more closely related to mammals than they are to amphibians, but we don't, we don't have a class um, called amniotology, right? Why do we study them separately from reptiles and amphibians? Well, there's a couple major reasons. One of them is ectothermy. So when you see the term uh, cold-blooded, that's a little bit inappropriate. What they are is animals whose body heat comes from the environment. And they can be very warm during the active part of their day and season, not necessarily cold. Um, but they do have the benefit of being able to cool themselves down, and that saves a heck of a lot of energy. Everything in biology and chemistry and physics happens faster at a warmer temperature. And so if you have a warmer body temperature, you're burning through your energy stores much faster. Mammals and birds are endothermic, meaning that they use the foodstuffs that they eat to generate their um, body temperature. It allows them to be active during times of the day and seasons when reptiles and amphibians cannot. It also allows them to live in some places that reptiles and amphibians cannot. There's not a whole lot of reptiles and amphibians hanging out with polar bears, for example. But because they are ectothermic, they often share, these reptiles and amphibian groups, uh, similarities with respect to ecology and natural history, physiology, a whole bunch of the different kinds of things you would learn in various biology and ecology classes. A few useful pieces of information, I think, in the context of this discussion. A lizard, as compared to a similar sized mammal, so this might be a small rodent or something, uses about 3% of the energy of that mammal over the course of a year. So what that means is they can live in fairly low productivity environments like deserts. So you'll see lots of reptiles in desert areas because there's not a whole lot of uh, biomass production as compared to places like the tropics. Doesn't mean you don't also see these species in the tropics as well. So at any given body temperature, so even if this reptile is thermoregulating at 98.6, like we are, it's still only using about 10% of the energy that we are, okay, on a mass-specific basis. They let their body temperature decrease at night, and there are plenty of endotherms that also do this, either daily or seasonally. Hummingbirds, for example, are on the edge of their physiological tolerances, and they have to drop their body temperature at night, or they will burn through all their reserves before morning, before they can go out and find more food. So they drop their body temperature to make it through the night. And obviously, we know of animals that do this seasonally, right? They hibernate in the winter, for example. And overall, uh, lizards have just lower activity um, patterns than mammals do. So it's not exactly the most exciting pet, right? Because you may have the thing just sitting there doing nothing for four months at a time. If you look at this figure here, body mass, on a log axis, so 10 kilogram animal on this end, a tenth of a gram animal on this end, energy use, grams per hour. As you get small, it gets more expensive per gram. And if you look at birds and mammals, at some point you don't see things much smaller than these sizes because it's just too darn expensive to be that small. So ecologically what this does is it opens up a whole bunch of niches a whole bunch of, of um, roles in the ecosystem that can't be taken up by those birds and mammals because they just can't be this small. So lots of salamanders especially, and many lizards and other amphibians, they will be very important converters of insect biomass into small vertebrate biomass, which then gets eaten by the mammals and the birds and that sort of thing. So they can be extremely important in ecosystems. And in fact, if you, if you talk to some folks who do research on the East Coast in some of the forests there, what is there to eat? Well, redback salamanders, right? They're, they're quite abundant. Another important uh, point from this topic is conversion efficiency. So this is how, how much of the food you eat do you turn into tissue, either your own tissue or your offspring or eggs, something like that. For these ectotherms, the average is about 50%. So 50% of the meal becomes biomass, which means 50% of the meal that they ate is now available for something else to eat further up the food chain. Okay? For mammals, it's between 1% and 2%. So we are inefficient machines. Basically, we're heat machines, right? We're like incandescent light bulbs walking around, sending off waste heat into the universe. 
But there are trade-offs, right? The activity period is restricted in space and time, which means their range is restricted, right? They can't inhabit uh, the coldest tops of mountains or the coldest latitudes. Body size and shape are also different in endotherms and ectotherms. How many mammals do you know that are shaped like snakes? Why is that a dumb mammal shape? Surface area is the big issue. That's exactly right. Okay. If you are a sphere, then you are maximizing the volume relative to surface area. So mammals tend to be sort of that shape-ish, maybe with some limbs sticking out. Right. Snakes are totally the opposite. They're very efficient at exchanging heat with the environment, which means they can heat up very quickly or cool down very quickly. But they can also coil up and reduce that surface area. So you see different shaped animals in these different groups. All right. Now, I mentioned that these things are restricted in space and time. That doesn't mean you can't see just about any reptile any day of the year. This is a picture from a visitor at Swarrow National Park, New Year's Day 2012. Okay. So they can be out and about. Um, either this one is out a little early foraging, looking for mates. Maybe it's sick. Maybe it's trying to thermoregulate. Some of the first studies of the efficacy of fever were done on lizards, putting them in a thermal gradient. And if you infect them with influenza or some other pathogen, they will choose to thermoregulate at a hotter temperature than if they're not sick. They give themselves a fever behaviorally. And we do it physiologically. All right. You can't live in the Sonoran Desert without being reminded where it is. So it's kind of this pea soup color here. Okay, Tucson is right on the edge. We are in the lushest part of the Sonoran Desert. All right, we get almost 12 inches of rain a year on average. We're right up against the Chihuahuan Desert. We also have Sky Islands, which offer an awesome diversity of habitat types for a whole bunch of different species, both coming down from Colorado, uh, the Colorado Plateau, and species with affinities in Canada. We also get species coming up from Mexico, Sierra Madre Occidental. So a tremendous diversity here. We have the iconic saguaro. We have a very similar but actually larger species that we find further south in Mexico. Anybody familiar with this? Not organ pipe. Organ pipe is also a columnar cactus, but it's smaller. Cardone, thank you very much. There is a cardone planted in the little cactus garden at uh, Tumamak Hill, if you'd like to see one. The rib spacing is different. There's more spacing between the ribs. If you're interested in more information about all of these organisms, there is a, a website that's maintained by some wonderful folks in Phoenix, reptilesofaz.org. So just substitute free thought AZ, just put in reptiles of AZ. <laughs> And you've got, the, you've got the right place. And even though it's called reptiles, they have all sorts of stuff on all the local resident amphibians and information about habitats. Now, if you look at the habitats in Arizona, you're going to find different species in different places because the climate is different. And to a first approximation, there's an interesting gradient that goes from the Four Corners area towards Yuma. And that is um, sort of higher and cooler down to lower and drier. And if you've ever spent time in Yuma, you know that it is hot and dry. So a little bit more about the Gila monster uh, per se. It's not a very aggressive animal unless you get in its face. And then it reminds you very quickly that it is venomous and would like you to back away. There are two truly venomous lizard species in the world. Uh, this one and its close relative, the beaded lizard, which you find in Mexico down in the Guatemala. And I'll tell you a little bit more about um, some of the venom research that's been done that indicates that venom may actually be a little more widespread in lizards. It's a protected species, as I mentioned before. So it's illegal to touch, kill, harass, collect, uh, any of those sorts of things, unless you have a permit from the state. They can be quite long-lived, over 20 years in the wild. Um, and we have some individuals that have been in captivity since the mid-1980s. They were uh, 
brought in because they've been found injured. And this animal has been in captivity since 1985. I think I was about 13. Where do you find Gila monsters? Well, inside that red circle, all of those black squares are actual sighting locations. There's two subspecies. Heloderma suspectum synctum is the banded pattern. Uh, suspectum suspectum is the reticulate one that we find here. And it ranges down into southern Sonora, where there is actually overlap with the much larger beaded lizard, which makes it basically down the coast and a couple of other subspecies, but down into Guatemala. There are some really neat features about these species. This is a close-up of the skin. Anyone know why it has those little bumps? Um, the bumps may, may have assist with camouflage if there's some distortion of um, shadows and that sort of thing, but I don't think that's the, the primary reason. Surface area. surface area is a good guess. Surface area is, but these guys, I don't know how much that adds. Um, given how big they are overall. But that's a possibility. Uh, we don't know of any senses going on in these, um, but that's a good guess because there's plenty of species that have various osmotic sensors, uh, salt sensors in their skin, um, or actually electronic sensors in amphibians, that sort of thing. What about, what about some similar reason to crocodile skin? Armor, very good armor. Okay. And each of those little dots is actually a little piece of bone in the skin. So they have what are called osteoderms. So if you look at an x-ray, it's got all these little bumps that are bone distributed throughout its, uh, throughout its skin. The ones atop the skull are fused to the skull, but these ones are free-floating in the skin, which is kind of neat. So what about the venom? Right? They have glands in the lower jaw, and they have grooves in their teeth. And they bite, they hold on, and that saliva has to wick up those grooves into the wound. So there's a number of paradoxes that come up. Because why would you want to hold on to something that you're trying to tell go away? Right? And if you know anything about their diet, which is like baby bunnies and eggs, I mean, it's not like they need to envenomate their prey in order to swallow it. So why they have venom is actually kind of a conundrum. Uh, it is true that Gila monsters are reticent to let go. A little unclear why that is. Um, people have reported success getting them to let go if they, if they put the animal down on the ground so that it now feels free and its legs are on the ground and now it feels like you aren't a threat anymore. Um, pulling can make the injury worse, you'll break off teeth, you'll cut yourself worse. Uh, if you happen to have like a bottle of rubbing alcohol around in your pocket, you can squirt that in their mouth, that'll get them to let go. Um, so we try some of those kinds of tricks in the field. We don't have to use them, thankfully, but we are prepared. A little bit more up close photo of this venom gland in the lower jaw here, and then these teeth with these grooves. Now, evolutionarily, we think that this is the same way that fangs formed in a number of snake species. You started with a groove, and then it got more and more efficient as it closed up more and more, and eventually it became a hollow tube. So just by way of comparison, right, these are these very modified fangs, function like hypodermic needles very dynamic skull. When they open their mouth up, the hinge is open about 180 degrees, and these teeth are pointing straight forward when they, when they uh, strike. Just to add a little info, because I think it's interesting, um, a rattlesnake skull and body are actually fairly fragile. So it does not want to grab onto something and wrestle with it. That's why it envenomates, lets go, lets the venom do its job of dispatching the animal and actually initiating digestion of the animal using that animal's own circulatory system before it dies. And then it chases the animal down uh, using sensory cues and then swallows it. 
There's no anti-venom for Gila monster bites. Uh, again, certain doctors, maybe from 1899, wouldn't be willing to treat you anyway if you came in bitten. <laughs> Most people report being able to evacuate themselves, um, you know, either on foot or by driving or picking up the phone. There may be one human fatality from a Gila monster bite, but that's still a little bit equivocal. But it's not like this is a big problem, people going out and being killed by Gila monsters. All of these venoms of all these species are a cocktail of all sorts of different things. And so there's several components of Gila monster venom that has been uh, studied for medicinal applications, including things for Alzheimer's disease, uh, ADHD, and type 2 diabetes. And it makes sense that you would have things that regulate glucose metabolism in a species that may only need to eat its body mass um, per year in order to survive. And at one sitting, it can eat about 33% of its body mass. And so you want to be able to control how that meal uh, gets into the tissues. So I won't read through all this. Here's this quote again from Dr. Ward. But, you know, if you do a little Google searching for uh, Gila monsters and venom, you can find a lot of interesting things. There's a list of all the different kinds of compounds and they affect blood um, pressure and heart rate, pain, swelling, all sorts of different things. One of the most widely used medicines that is a clone of a compound found in this Gila monster venom is called Bayetta and a number of folks um, with type 2 diabetes take Bayetta to help control their glucose levels. So an interesting development from research. Now a number of the folks who study uh, reptiles, especially venomous ones, I think have their own testosterone issues. Um, <laughs> but there's a gentleman, Brian Fry, who may or may not fit that description. Here he is hugging a Komodo dragon, okay? So that takes a certain personality. But he's done a lot of work on <laughs> venom evolution. And I'll blow up this picture here. We know that there's lots of different venom components in snakes. And a number of those in purple here seem to have evolved in the lineage that leads to snakes today. We have a couple of components, especially uh, the Exendin, that is what that Bayetta is modeled after. Those evolved in the lineage going to the Gila monster and the beaded lizard. And then we have some other things, including this big group of venom components that are found in the precursor of snakes and a huge group of lizards. Varanids includes all the monitor lizards, the Komodo dragon, Iguania includes pretty much everything that lives around here other than our whiptails. Okay. So it's not that these lizards are venomous, but it's that they have the, the genetic architecture and the protein production capabilities to make these compounds. They just don't necessarily have um, the delivery system, nor do they make them in any great quantities. So uh, some interesting research going on with respect to how long venom has been around. And the big picture argument is that it's just modified saliva, right? You start breaking down your foodstuffs in your mouth, not only with the physical mastication, but also with the, the chemical properties of the saliva. And so if you become more efficient at that, that gets selected for, et cetera. They spend most of their time feeding um, at ground level or underground. They're looking for quail eggs as a favorite food. They will uh, attack desert tortoise nests, and there's several documented cases around here of a female tortoise trying to defend her eggs, her nest, against a Gila monster. Um, I don't think that the Gila monster has ever lost or backed away. The female tortoise uh, tends to lose her entire clutch every time. But young rabbits, uh, pack rats, baby mammals, here I believe is a, a baby cottontail being consumed at the field site of uh, a gentleman named Roger Rep, who does a lot of work on this species and rattlesnake species in the greater Tucson area. 
They're actively foraging. They're not sit and wait predators uh, the way rattlesnakes would, would be considered. So they're looking for these nests. They're looking for these altricial and um, defenseless young endotherms. Like I mentioned before, they can eat about 33% of their body mass at a time. They may only eat three, four times a year. And they have really powerful jaws and teeth. They are holding on to their prey very strongly, crunching it down. They are not trying to inject venom and let go the way a rattlesnake is. But again, why do they need the venom to eat quail eggs? Now something that becomes very useful for us uh, as biologists trying to study these is that as adults, their patterns are fixed. And so that modeled pattern on the back is like a fingerprint or like the patterns on whale flukes or on tiger stripes or cheetah spots, right? So you can, you can identify individuals based on photographs of the sides or the top of the animal. They also tend to have uh, interesting scars, missing pieces of their tail. Uh, we have an individual that we're studying that is missing one of its eyes from in some sort of an encounter. So you add that to the pattern and you get very unique identifiers. You may find several individuals together in a burrow underground. Uh, they tend to come back to the same areas over and over and over again, which is interesting ecologically. It also points to what are the important habitat features out there in the desert. It can also be um, a challenge in a conservation context if their environment becomes modified or if there's a road or a fence or a central Arizona canal or a housing development and they keep trying to go back to that place that they've been going to for 10 years. That can get them in trouble. This acronym GOAG is, um, actually it's a little outdated now, Gophorus agassizii. This is the desert tortoise. Oftentimes you'll find desert tortoises and Gila monsters hanging out in the same burrows. Oftentimes Gila monsters are using burrows that were created by pack rats. And pack rats arguably are, are ecosystem engineers. They are modifying the environment to provide these cooler, higher humidity um, microhabitats that all sorts of different species rely on in the desert. They can be active year round. Um, you're not likely to see one on New Year's Day, but it's possible. Now arguably they're also camouflaged, but they also have a warning coloration, which again is one of these um, kind of paradoxes. So if you see something that is brightly colored like a caterpillar or a wasp or um, any sort of bug, does that make you a little more hesitant to pick it up or poke at it? Usually there's this concept of aposomatic coloration in biology where things become brightly colored to advertise their dangerousness or their toxicity and species either learn that evolutionarily or they learn that during their lifetime that they should avoid those kinds of things. And so they definitely are brightly colored, but if you think about that modeled pattern under the dappled sunlight of a bush of some type, creosote or otherwise, it's actually fairly, fairly cryptic. They can blend in quite well. So this would be a, another extreme example of aposomatic coloration. There's lots of interesting research using clay models of uh, coral snakes and mixing up the colors and the patterns and then looking at the number of beak marks, basically pecking into these clay models. And the things that are just plain brown, they get pecked the most. And the things that have the more dramatic patterns with more colors get pecked the least. And there's kind of a spectrum in between. So it's, it's worked as an evolutionary strategy. We also think it's worked because there's a number of species that mimic coral snakes. Right? They take advantage of the fact that predators avoid these and they, uh, they will copy this pattern. We've talked about venom, powerful jaws. They do have very sharp teeth, cryptic, long-lived, and arguably very successful in the places that they live. So if you go uh, to Saguaro National Park or if you go to the areas around Sabino Canyon, the numbers are actually uh, quite impressive. There's also a study at Stone Canyon Golf Course that is finding amazing densities of Gila monsters, arguably because you have this water supplementation in the desert. So you have all this 
extra resource base, and Gila monsters and rattlesnakes are abundant and um, thriving. So there's, a, there's an upside to golf courses in the desert. Again, some photos feeding on quail eggs, feeding on a small rabbit. <clears throat> Seeing these kinds of things is extremely rare. Finding a Gila monster at all is challenging, let alone finding it uh, eating or wrestling with another male for access to mating opportunities. There are a species that's fairly new to the desert. This is one hanging out in the shade at the little pay kiosk as you go into the Saguaro National Park Rincon Mountain uh, Loop Road. Okay, so it's hanging out under the air conditioner there. Their relatives are tropical and they have fairly tropical physiologies. Their skin is not especially water resistant, so they lose water fairly quickly compared to uh, things like chuckwallas, which are much better adapted to the desert, arguably. Some research uh, from a lab up in Phoenix, Dale DiNardo, who I collaborate with on this work, he does a lot of um, physiological ecology, looking at how physiology and environment and uh, ecology interact. And if you heat these Gila monsters up, at some point, there's this big burst of water loss that he can measure. And he couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And it turns out when they get overheated, they will basically evert their cloaca. So reptiles have, have one urogenital opening, okay? And they'll evert fluid from that cloaca to evaporate it. So it's, it's sort of a modified panting mechanism just from the other end, okay? And they use that. They'd rather not lose water, but if the, if the trade-off is that I'm going to overheat and die right now, you're better off losing a little water and hoping you can find some to, to restore that. Uh, they can't handle the heat. They don't like to be as warm or as hot as a bunch of other desert reptiles, so they'll spend a lot of time underground, or in some times of the year, they'll become uh, nocturnal. So obviously, there are people who um, have come up with various uh, possible challenges to Gila monsters with climate change. And I think those are, those are valid and uh, interesting to pursue what the effects might be in their habitat. They're not threatened or endangered, so they're not on the Endangered Species Act list or anything like that. Uh, as I mentioned before, they are protected. Things like roads and housing developments and shopping malls obviously affect them negatively uh, on the whole. We unfortunately see lots of individuals killed on roads, especially those perimeter roads around the park. There's a gentleman uh, at Eastern Washington University named Dan Beck who did his PhD here. He's arguably the world's expert on the Gila monsters and beaded lizards. And he's voiced concerns about loss of this species from the edges of its range, those little pockets that get into Nevada and Utah and California. Uh, poaching is a, is a problem on the black market, or even if, if they can argue that they were captively bred, uh, you, can, you can fetch four figures for a Gila monster. Given that they have this new to the desert physiology, some of the areas most important to them are the areas that we find most attractive in the desert as well. For example, these riparian areas. So this is in the Rincons looking to the west. If you've ever driven the loop road, this is um, that uphill part. If you ever biked the loop road, you will remember this uphill part <laughs> right here. Um, and this was a day that the Loma Verde wash was, was running quite, quite nicely as the sun was going down. So these are the areas where you tend to find them in fairly high densities. So there's been a lot of folks involved in the work that we've been doing out at Swore National Park specifically. Lots of undergraduate students, lots of volunteers. Uh, I had an intern from Northern Arizona University down this past summer. I have some uh, former U of A graduates. There's a program on campus called the Undergraduate Biology Research Program, and I've had a couple of folks through that program as well. So not only is it, is it a useful um, research opportunity, but I, I view it as an important educational tool and outreach tool. Because if you can get people interested in listening to you because they're interested in Gila monsters, then you can talk to them a little bit about science and research and evidence and that sort of stuff. 
So we've been working on this um, starting in 2009, studying the population in part of the park, basically the western piece of the Rincon Mountain District. So near the visitor center and that loop road, we tend to use that as a transect that we can drive repeatedly looking for animals. We want to know how the population is doing, and it seems to be doing quite well. Um, what are the impacts of human activities? So one of the things we're trying to do more of is work with uh, homeowners and landowners that are just outside the park and study the animals that they find on their property and see how often they're crossing the roads into the park or are they staying wholly out of the park? You know, what does housing density have to do with uh, population health, those sorts of things. So the loop road is this eight mile loop in yellow here. We've also spent a fair bit of time looking in the Havelina picnic area and some of the trails nearby. We've walked this cactus forest loop uh, quite a few times. And then again, that photo that I took from here in this Loma Verde drainage was looking to the west here. So lots of research activity here. Part of the reason we, we focused on this area for an off-trail search site is that there's been a lot of research done there on desert tortoises. And so there's already a lot of information about those guys and the burrows that they use in that area. And so that sped up our work uh, quite a bit. There was a fire there called the Mother's Day Burn. I think it was in the mid-90s that um, was followed by a study of the saguaros and the desert tortoises and how they respond to the fire. So we search for animals. Um, when we find them, we take pictures of them, we measure them. That way if we recapture them, we can look at growth patterns, uh, we can look at movement patterns. We insert a pit tag, and I actually brought one with me. I don't know if you can see that out there. This is a syringe. And a pit tag is kind of like a little grain of rice. It's the exact same technology that they use for cats and dogs that they put in the nape of the neck. And so it's a passive integrated transponder, which means you have to have some sort of a device that sends energy to it and then gets a signal bounced back to it. Um, and so we put those in all the animals that, that we handle. We also have five individuals that we've put small radio transmitters into, and that allows us to go out and see where they are on the landscape whenever we're out there looking for them. We have a couple of cameras. One of them is a fancy expensive burrow camera and the other one I picked up at Home Depot and it's a sewer cam that plumbers use to look down your drains. Um, and they both work quite well. We've also been taking uh, DNA swabs. And so uh, this, this takes a little bit of training for the field crew. <laughs> but. The same, the same mouth swabs that you, that you would use to do like uh, DNA fingerprinting or paternity analysis or some of you may have um, heard of the program that was on campus, um, it still is, the National Geographic uh, Human Genographic Project, basically looking at the history of, of humans on the planet and letting you identify which part of the human diaspora you came from. So we work with those folks, that's where we actually do our DNA work. And since we're out there, we collect a whole lot of other information that is useful for the park. So what snakes do we see, what lizards, what amphibians? And if you look at the literature of what is useful in the context of climate change, it's these data sets that people collected, sometimes just sort of incidentally or anecdotally, that may be 50 or 100 years old. And somebody comes back and says, wow, look at that. I can do that again you know, today, and now I can compare. But most people don't go out and just write down all the common stuff um, all the time. And, and we, because we've been talking with folks who've been doing decades-long research in the park on saguaros and that sort of stuff, we understand the value of these long-term data sets. So we're trying to contribute to that as well. Gets a little busy out there, gets a little, um, you know, you think, wow, I get to go out in the field and chase Gila monsters. Yeah, but you also have to fill out the paperwork and enter the data and that sort of stuff. So um, when I have students coming to volunteer, I make sure they understand the full, the full picture. But we take a lot of information about location. We take a lot of information about environmental and weather conditions. And we write down um, GPS coordinates, pit tags, those sorts of things. Here's a couple of my field crew members this summer. 
we were tracking an animal near the Havelina picnic area, and we pinpointed it in a pack rat midden at the base of this mesquite. It's kind of a small one, you can't really see it, but you know, there's 10 minutes of data collection at least that go on there. And the Park Service likes us to wear these yellow um, vests, which, you know, your 20 something field tech isn't the most excited about wearing. But it lets the park know that we're willing to be visible, so we're probably not out there poaching or doing something illegal. And the Park Service has been extremely cooperative. And especially the rangers, right, they're out there all the time, and so they will report their sightings to us, which uh, increases our, our data set. This was later that same evening. We found a, a juvenile on the loop road. And again, lots of processing and measuring. We take several photos to document that pattern so that if we see that animal again in a few years, we can link those two observations together. This is uh, Brian Park, who's now running a turtle research station in the middle of the Pacific. But he was working on this project, and uh, there was an animal that Park Service staff had found, and so he went out and processed it for them. He's taking body length measurements. Here we take head width measurements. There's a pretty strong correlation between head width and sex. The males tend to have bigger heads. Um, <laughs> take, take that for what you will. but. They tend to be bigger overall because they wrestle with each other for access to females. And so being bigger and being able to knock the other guy over um, improves your fitness, your ability to pass on your genes. Here's that mouth swabbing, right? Um, they don't necessarily enjoy that. We don't necessarily either. But it allows us to get DNA because we just scrape cells off the roof of the mouth without having to go to the trouble of actually doing like a venipuncture and taking a blood sample. Uh, that's the best way because they have red blood cells that have nuclei. Our red blood cells are, um, do not have nuclei, so there's no DNA in our red blood cells. But reptile blood is really good for doing DNA work. But we do mouth swabs um, for most of our individuals so that we get some cells. We also measure tail volume. Any thoughts on why we measure tail volume? Fat storage, very good. So that's an indicator of, of body condition. How healthy are these animals? You know, other metrics are the relationship between body mass and length. And so if you have something that's really skinny, it's not doing as well as something that's um, nice, and, nice and plumped up. And the tail volume will tell us that as well. So we do the water displacement and then uh, write down how much fell out of that flask. You may have seen this article a week ago, it was a week ago today actually, uh, in the paper about this DNA work that we're doing with these swabs. We have samples from uh, going on 150, 200 individuals and the, the microsatellites, the actual technology for being able to do like DNA fingerprinting is not yet developed for this species, so we're working on that right now. Um, we just ran the DNA through a, a high sequence um, output program, and we have millions of candidate microsatellites that now I've got students working on coming up with the individual markers that we can use. And the reason why that's interesting is because that will allow us to say things about whether or not this population went through a bottleneck event. How, uh, how closely related is the population in the Rincons to the population in the Catalinas? Do they move between the Catalinas um, and the Tucson Mountains? Do they move from the Rincons to the Santa Ritas? All these kinds of things we can answer with DNA. I'll talk more about this, but there's a big citizen science component to what we're doing. And there's a website that we developed called herpcount.org. And if folks have sightings, especially of tortoises, Gila monsters, and snakes, we'd really love to get those sightings uploaded to this website because finding these things is really challenging. And if you've got you know, four or five biologists out there at any one time looking for these things, that's actually not that many animals that you're running into. But if you've got uh, an educated and interested public, then that's hundreds or thousands of additional sightings that you're going to get uh, in a given year. And I think it also is a vehicle for um, 
I sort of mentioned this outreach and science component. If you get people invested in being a part of the science, then they're going to think more about science and how to do science. So radio telemetry, again, we have radios in five animals. These radios, we, we paid the premium for the ones that will beep at a different rate depending on the temperature at which that radio was at. So we can get the body temperature of the animal when we go out and find out where it is on the landscape. And again, sometimes they'll move 500 meters or a kilometer in a night. Sometimes they won't move for three months. This lets us see uh, where they partition habitat use seasonally, right? Where do they go in the winter versus where do they go in the summer? Which way are their rock crevices facing? They tend to like south facing things in the winter so that if they want to, they can come up closer to the surface and get a little bit warmed up and then go back down a little bit deeper. Are there differences between males and females? Heck yeah, males spend a lot more time walking around basically because they're looking for females. And it's, you know, humans, most sexually reproducing species are the same way, right? Females are the limiting resource and males spend a lot of time wooing them. So I want to show you a short clip. This is an interview with Dale DiNardo uh, up at ASU. He has done some work on Gila monster populations northwest of Tucson, kind of in the same area that that gentleman Roger Rep has done some work as well. Um, I'm disappointed often in the National Geographic videos that I see and how they treat science. So take this one with a grain of salt, but I do want to show you. This is the vet. He's a, he's a PhD. Um, veterinarian up at ASU and he does our radio implant surgeries for us because he's he's the best in the world at doing Gila monster uh, surgery. These characters have been causing some problems around the U.S. and Northern Desert. So I'm not sure what kind of trouble he was talking about them getting into, but uh, I guess conflict cells. So if you saw the, the red device being put into the animal, it's about the size of a AA battery. And the ones we get have about a two-year uh, battery life. At least that's what we're told. So we take them out at about 18 months 
Otherwise, um, if the battery dies, then you've lost the animal and your $350 radio. And again, when we're out radio tracking, we take lots of data on location and environmental conditions because we want to know where these guys are, what are the conditions that bring them up, cause them to move around, what season, what humidity, those sorts of things. When we're out and about, this is what we might find out in the open in an easy to access burrow, maybe not visible at all. This is actually very common. You know, so this is where we find them. We take a picture and say, yep, yeah, that's where the beeps are coming from. Sometimes we'll get enough of a glimpse that we can say, oh yeah, there definitely is a Gila monster in there. We implemented the burrow cams because we want to know a little bit more about what they're doing when they're spending that 90, 95% of their time underground. And we also want to know that if we track an animal to a burrow, is the animal actually in there? Can we see it? Or are there other individuals in there with it? Okay. So another thing specifically that we want to know about is female nest sites. We know actually very little about reproduction of these guys in the wild. They will mate in the spring, and then uh, eggs will be laid in the fall, or uh, in the monsoon season into the fall. And then it's unclear if they hatch out and remain underground as little hatchlings, or if the eggs actually overwinter, and then they hatch out and the animals come up above. Because we don't see them come out until, uh, until the next late spring the next year, which is pretty amazing. It's a really long incubation time, if that is the case. So here's an animal, picture taken when we were um, processing it and then took it up to Phoenix for its surgery. And then here is a tracking event, what, eight months later, seven months later. And we can see from the pattern on the head that we're matching the pattern on the side of his head here. Okay. Uh, this one might be a little bit easier. This is a different individual. These are the radio frequencies, 166, 252, 166, 291. This is one of our documentary photos in captivity. And then here's the burrow cam. And you see this little knob right here, right? That's the same as this little knob right here. And so you can, you know, you can convince yourself after looking at three dots here and three dots here that you've got the same animal, which is very useful. Animals that we've um, captured and processed we started off uh, small in 2009, and then we've picked up 34 in 2010, 43 in 2000, 2011, 55 in 2012. Some of those are recaptures, and the recaptures are important because the ratio of new captures to recaptures can let you do some math to let you estimate population sizes, which is very handy. Um, I've got four and a half dead animals here because we found one that was in the throes of death on the road. And then we held on to it, and it didn't die, and it didn't die, and it didn't die. And finally, we took it to, to a vet, and uh, he's rehabbing it. It seems to be doing pretty well. Oftentimes, if they get hit on the head, they'll break their jaw, so they won't be able to eat um, in the wild, but they'll survive. So, you know, to my mind, this is pretty impressive for seeing Gila monsters, right? Nobody goes out and, and sees dozens of Gila monsters in a year. But this is a lot of people spending a lot of time out at the exact right times in the exact right places. The animals that we have radios in, uh, again, I mentioned that we've got five radios out there. We have one individual who hangs out at the visitor center, and so he gets seen a lot by the, by the staff and the visitors there. There's some machinery that they have that interferes with the radio signal, though, so he's actually very hard to track, even though you can sit in a parking lot and try and do it. Um, there's another individual here, Loma Verde, and you'll see the scale here. This is about 800 meters right here. So from end to end, this is a little more than 800 meters. So over the course of a year, these things move around quite a bit. Uh, we have a few individuals down here. This is the Havelina picnic area, that little loop right there. And so they love this area, this washy area next to that picnic area. If you look at when we encounter these things, uh, it varies seasonally, right? If you go out looking in December and January, November, it's very unlikely you're going to see anything, and it's kind of a waste of resources. 
starting in March, it gets a little more likely, then into April. May is a really good time to see them out uh, during the day. We drop off in June, just like the rest of us, we try and stay out of that dry heat um, until the monsoons hit. And then once the monsoons hit, these guys are active like crazy, but it's not during the day anymore. It's at night. Okay. So um, here you've got night and day uh, encounters in the different colors. Most of them are at night in July and August and September. And then things uh, are just wrapping up for us right now. And the animals that we have radios in, we know they're not moving anymore. If you look at size class, right, this is snout vent length, which is uh, in millimeters the length from the tip of the snout to where the vent comes out of the body at the base of the tail. So obviously a longer animal is a big adult. These ones are the juveniles, and you'll see that we don't see them until uh, late spring. That's when they start coming out. And then we see huge numbers of them, probably because most of them are young and naive and stupid and less able to hide themselves, so we find them. Um, and then they drop off again by August. I don't know if that's because they got smarter or because a big subset of them is now somebody else's food. Right? And then we don't see those juveniles after about September. Oops, I went the wrong way there. Is there a question? Uh, everything preys on them that, that can eat them, you know, that's the right size. So um, mammals, uh, snakes, birds of prey, all of those. And obviously more things can eat them the smaller they are. So, you know, just there's a, one of my mentors on campus, a herpetologist named Cecil Schwalbe, he calls uh, desert tortoise juveniles the Oreos of the desert, <laughs> right? Because they're kind of crunchy on the outside and creamy on the inside. Yes? Um, people have looked at that kind of superficially. Doesn't seem to be any negative impact. Um, it's, you know, if you have that stuff in your gut, then you're breaking down all those proteins with your digestive enzymes and that kind of stuff. It's only when you get it in your circulatory system that it's a challenge. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure that there are a number of species that will choose to avoid Gila monsters if they have something else they can eat just because they don't want to risk getting bit. Um, how toxic or how painful that venom is to other species is a little bit of an unknown. Birds will definitely attack them, uh, especially hawks and that sort of stuff. We'll, we'll eat the juveniles. Um, owls too. Roadrunners for sure. Yep. But again, only the small ones. So again, I mentioned that we're documenting non-Gila monster species. Um, as far as baseline data, we take photos of everything of interest. So here's a coral snake of which we've seen maybe five over the last three years. Um, by species, the thing we see most often and way more than we see Gila monsters is diamondbacks. So if you're going to encounter a snake in the wild around here, if you had to bet on one species, bet diamondback. They're everywhere. Uh, and then where we're looking is in the, the rocky foothills. That's a, a favorite haunt of tiger rattlesnakes. We see lots of gopher snakes. We see black-tailed rattlesnakes. We see night snakes. And I actually, I get night snakes fairly often at my house near Broadway and Craycroft, which is pretty cool. Um, we got some long-nosed snakes. I lost my cursor again. Long-nosed snakes, black neck garter snakes. These guys are tied to water. They, they tend to eat um, tadpoles and, uh, and hang out in wet ecosystems. Coach whips. This is interesting to note that we never see them at night. These are a very warm, um, diurnal um, search, search and destroy predator. And then a combination of other species adds up to, to quite a few individuals. So these are very useful data for the park that we are kind of um, able to contribute as we're looking for Gila monsters. We find lots of desert tortoises as well. Some of them uh, have been involved in research before, so they've got little notches in their marginal scutes. And so we can actually look at that animal. We don't pick them up, but we look at them. And we, if we see those notches, we can write down what pattern those notches are in. We tell the park, and they look up in their database what they know about that individual. 
and some of them have been, you know, documented out there 15, 20 years, which is really pretty cool. We see quite a few of them near that Havelina picnic area when we're out on foot trying to radio track. That's, that's often when we see these guys. Um, over a two-year period, we've, we found 38 different desert tortoises, which is a, a pretty good number. Lizard species, we see lots and lots of uh, some of the common species that you even find in town, like desert spiny lizards and tiger whiptails and Sonoran spotted whiptails. Those are pretty common on campus here. Western banded geckos. These are not the geckos that are hanging out by your porch light eating the insects. Those are uh, an introduced Mediterranean gecko. But the western banded geckos love to hang out on the roads, kind of the way tarantulas do when the humidity goes up. And so if you're driving that loop road, you'll see tons of, of these little guys. So this pie chart here is uh, 1,600 individual sightings of lizards, so quite a few. Some of these species you're, you're not likely to see active at night. Some of them are actually sleeping on the road, like these greater earless lizards will do that. Horn lizards on occasion, collared lizards on occasion. We also see a few species of amphibian. And again, this is very seasonal. We're not seeing these guys in May and June. We're seeing them in the monsoon season. And we have GPS records of where we see them. So we can help inform the park about when and where they're having uh, huge numbers of amphibians crossing the road. If you've ever been fortunate or unfortunate enough to drive out to the Rincon Valley um, during a good monsoon storm, there'll be thousands of toads on the road. And you, know, you, can, you can almost sort of hydroplane on toads if you're not careful. I wish I had a video of this, but uh, this summer, so just other things that we get to see. This is a tarantula hawk, a pepsis wasp. What they do, the female lays its eggs in a tarantula, paralyzes it, takes it back down into the tarantula's burrow, and then the eggs hatch out and eat that tarantula. Okay? These guys were facing off wrestling. She went in for the, for the kill, and I think that this tarantula was able to, to bite her and because um, she kind of went nuts, he was fine, and she went down into his hole and just kind of started freaking out. And I'd never seen anything like this. So interesting observations. Um, there's a gentleman in town whom you may have heard of, Justin Schmidt. Um, this is you know, one of those serious biologists who takes his work personally and created the Schmidt Sting Pain Index. Okay, and in order to create the Schmidt Sting Pain Index, you have to get yourself stung by all kinds of things. And this tarantula hawk or pepsis wasp is uh, one of the very worst. His description, immediate excruciating pain that simply shuts down one's ability to do anything except perhaps scream. Mental discipline simply does not work in these situations. <laughs> That's a lot of pain. That's a lot of pain. So a little bit more about the citizen science, why this is so useful to us. This isn't new to Gila monsters, right? There's a, there's a group called the National Phenology Network taking the pulse of our planet that relies on people to contribute sightings of bird nesting or uh, flower buds. And these things are changing across the landscape as climate changes. And so being able to track that in large numbers is extremely important. You may have heard of the Christmas bird count. This is another one of these um, centuries old citizen science endeavors that adds a whole lot of information over long time periods and broad geographic scales. It's extremely important in our understanding of, of how populations move and change and how climate is affecting that. There's a group called Citizen Science Alliance, which is trying to sort of pull all these different groups together. So there's a portal for finding out about these research projects. And around here, you may have heard of this research project. Uh, Dave Bertelson has been hiking the Finger Rock Trail for 25 years, documenting exactly when and where he sees flowers uh, of all the different species. And his database, right, 25 years of hiking the same trail every week, extremely useful in looking at the changes in both pushing uh, flowering uphill and 
earlier in the year, okay? consistent with what we would expect climate change to do. And I tried to calculate how much it would cost to get this data set if you did it like with the National Science Foundation. Right? And it's millions of dollars worth of data that this gentleman's collected just because he likes to go hiking every week. And uh, one of my <clears throat> grad students right now published a paper with him recently and went out in the field and talked with him. It takes him 22 hours now to do his hike. He's 70-ish he's or so. And so this is quite a commitment on his part these days. All right, for us, on average, in 2011, it took us 13 hours to find a Gila monster. Okay. That's a lot of time in the field. Okay. We can improve our success rate by being in the car driving that loop road because a Gila monster kind of stands out on the pavement at night in the headlights or even during the day. Um, when we go hiking, every 32 hours we find a Gila monster. Okay. So that's not very good odds. This is why we really want people to contribute their sightings to, to bolster these um, these numbers. So we put out flyers like this one. We encourage folks to upload their sightings to herpcount.org. Again, that pattern is diagnostic or unique in these adults, which is a very powerful tool for us. We have a website that uh, documents our efforts and some of the sightings. Here's an individual that was hit on the road and as part of its death was regurgitating the quail eggs it had just eaten. We talked about this a little bit. That pattern allows us to use these data much more effectively than lots of other citizen science projects. So here's a recapture example. This is our field team taking a picture. And then a few months later, here's a sighting that was reported by a volunteer park patrol person. And then if you compare those photos and also the location, um, this is the same individual. And so that adds a whole lot of information to our project. So one of the things we're spending a lot of time and energy on right now is this DNA analysis, especially as we come to this uh, downtime of the season. What are we going to be able to find out once we get these microsatellites developed? We're really excited about looking at um, population structure, meaning if you look in one drainage, do you have a group of related individuals as compared to another drainage, or are they moving around so much that you can't really tell? There's lots of good resources out there if you want to learn more about Gila monsters. I mentioned the reptiles of AZ, the Tucson Herp Society uh, is a very active and um, useful resource in town. It's not herpetoculturists, it's not people who are meeting to talk about their pets, but uh, it's folks who are interested in the science, education, and conservation of the species. I mentioned Dan Beck earlier. He has a wonderful book out, 2005, about Gila monsters and beaded lizards. Dale DiNardo at ASU, lots of great information there, and uh, obviously the Herp Count site for uploading sightings, and this tiny.cc Gila Monster URL will take you to the documentation that we've uploaded uh, through the university. Showed you so we have posters that we've put together for various outreach events, talking about the non Gila Monster species, details about the Gila Monsters themselves. We've done uh, some photo shoots. So I know, I know a little bit more about how they do those National Geographic things. That stuff is not, uh, those are not natural behaviors, like the Gila monster in the toilet. <laughs> All right, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. I have one question, uh, Kevin. Uh, the, some of the um, lizards, they go like this, like they're doing push-ups. Uh -huh. What are they doing that for? They're doing push-ups. No, they're, <laughs> they're head bobbing because that is, um, that is an unusual movement in the environment that attracts the attention of other males. And they're saying, this is my territory, you go away. Or to females, it says, hey, come check me out. And when they do that, they often have um, 
bright colors on their ventral surface that they are displaying. And they want to keep those hidden so the predators don't find them. But when they're doing the push-ups, they're showing off this bright coloration. The patterns of those bobs can be species specific too. So some females will ignore, you know, up, up, down, up, but they really like up, down, down, up, down. <laughs> oh, I lived in Ventana Canyon from, yes. from 1999 through to 2006. Lots of Gila monsters. Lots there. of Gila monsters I saw. I had them in my garage. And um, I'm wondering, I had Rural Metro come and remove them uh -huh. from my garage. Uh -huh. Does Rural Metro report to you what they find? Um, no, they don't, um, and we haven't reached out as effectively as we could with them. I've had some colleagues who've had some challenges with rural metro in the past because they've, they've collected animals and they will just wait till they get a bucket full of snakes and then they'll go out and they'll dump them somewhere. And the research that has been done on relocation studies shows that if you, if you don't move them more than a mile away, they just go back to where they were, which is fine. The homeowner's probably never going to see them again. If you move them further than that away, they tend to die because they're in a place that they're not familiar with that's already occupied with other individuals. So um, that, that became a little bit of an issue. And then the second comment, I know Justin Schmidt, and uh, uh, he knows pain. He was struck by a rattlesnake, and I'm sure you probably know that. Uh, I did know that. I haven't talked with him extensively about his experience with that, but you know. He I'm actually, he almost what? He almost died. He almost died. Yeah. Canada. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the danger. With the, when was he bit? Do you know what year it was? Uh, I would think it was probably uh, 10 years ago or a little longer than that. He was, struck, he was feeding the rattler. Okay. And he was struck by a man who was feeding. The, the anti-venom technology has changed a little bit because the way, the way it historically was made is you inject little bits of venom uh, into horses, and then they produce the antibodies, and then you extract those, and then you give them to the person. And most people have an allergic reaction not to the antivenom part of that protein, but to what the horse produces sort of attached to that. Um, and so recently, we've gotten better at cleaving off more of that protein that causes the allergic reactions. Yeah. Beyond the uh, reportings of sightings, are there more direct opportunities for people who don't necessarily have the formal biological training and background in education? I do a lot of hiking, and I see a lot of um, reptiles and, and insects and a lot of other things and I've always been trying to find more direct opportunities to become involved with real research. Do, do you have opportunities for that sort of thing? Uh, sure. I, I think the, the easiest answer to that is like the herpcount.org website where you can upload these sightings. There's also a more international group um, which I think is called, I'm blanking on it now, it's not NEON, that's a different I'll, I'll get back to you on that, but it's, it's, it's one of these sites that is allowing people to upload photos of wildlife from around the world. Um, I like this herp count one because it's a little bit more closely controlled and we can go in and we can vet the observations and, um, and verify you know, that that is the species that the person says it is, that sort of thing. This global one, you get things like there was a lizard on my lawn chair. Right? And, and an, a fuzzy out of focus picture. I mean, they're not, I'm stereotyping a little bit, but sometimes the data aren't as high a quality. But if, if you want to get more involved and you, know, you and I can talk and, and um, I'd love to have you uh, contribute. That'd be great, you bet. Hi, it's uh, wonderful work you're doing. This is the first I've heard of this. Um, I'm wondering if um, there is, uh, some research effort, maybe as a subset of, of this, uh, and at the risk of sounding a little esoteric, to make a connection about how uh, we can learn about ourselves from, from these lizards. I, I'm, I'm thinking of the phrase, you know, we all have the reptilian brain, is, is that, or part of our brain. Um, I suppose if you go back far enough billions of years, we, we all have a common ancestor, uh, even with uh, with the Gila monster. Yeah, it's a lot less than that. It's, you know, it's 300 plus million years. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, you were talking about, for example, the, the mating patterns. I, I wonder, for example, if you dissect one of the deceased species, if you could learn about uh, whether a Gila monster experiences an orgasm the same way we do by dissecting their brains, or, or do you find uh, 
about uh, five to ten percent of them who engage in, in same-sex behavior or transgender behavior. Sure. If there's any, uh, you know, efforts to... <laughs> You're right. Any, any of that kind of thing. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. Um, I guess I view getting folks involved in research as a way for them to just start think more, thinking more about biology generally. And once you start looking into biology, you realize how similar we are to everything that's out there. We all share a common ancestor with all other life on a planet. Um, you know, even you go back a little farther, you get common ancestors with plants and that kind of stuff, bacteria. Um, lots of the DNA that we have that codes for important things that we do actually is from long ago invasions of viruses bringing pieces of DNA into, into our uh, chromosomes. You know, we're talking way, way back, but uh, there's so many similarities that there's a heck of a lot that we can learn. Details of, of orgasms in Gila Moss, I don't know anybody has gone there. <laughs> Funding for that is probably hard to come by. Um, you know, those kinds of things tend to get done in model systems that people can more readily say are more closely related to us, like mouse models and rat models and primates and that kind of stuff. Um, as far as the, the behavior of uh, same-sex sexual behaviors and that kind of stuff, that is extremely widespread in animals, um, especially for males. It doesn't really cost anything. Even, even if you're not, you know, a, a gay reptile, for example, um, it doesn't really cost you a whole lot to engage in those behaviors. Um, you'll see toads mating with clumps of mud on the road, right? They're up for a couple weeks, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to reproduce. That's the only th chance they've seen. And, um, you know, so that, se as far as I can tell, if you look at the animal world, you know, sexuality is, this, is sort of a continuum. And there's, there's lots of things that kind of fall in the middle. Yes? Uh, getting to a blander subject, have you ever come across um, an albino? Gila monster? I have not come across an albino Gila monster. That's interesting. And I have not heard of any in the pet trade, but that's actually not something I'm, I'm all that up on. Um, lots of examples of albino snakes, but I haven't heard of an example of an albino Gila monster. Are they pretty muscular for their size? They're quite muscular. They're quite so muscular. that it, you have to be attentive and... You do. You have to be attentive and the beaded lizard, which is their close relative, which gets to be maybe twice as long, two and a half times as long. They're so strong that, you know, even if you're holding as tight as you can, you feel like you're on the edge of this. Like holding a fire hose. Exactly. exactly. Well, How old is this? Be free? This one's about 30 years, which would be unusual for the wild. This has been in captivity since the mid-80s. What about disease from their skin? Can you pick up anything from touching them? Uh, salmonella is actually pretty common in reptiles. And so anyone who wants to touch them, I've got some germs. Um, okay, if we take this picture. Yeah, you can take this picture. And, oh, and um, if, you want, if you want a piece of skin, you can have some skin. Nah, okay. <laughs> so reptiles uh, tend to shed synchronously, or at least small mates do. So all their shed, all their skin at once. It's most obvious in snakes because you get that intact shed. But these guys, you know, the skins all come out at the same time. With your tracking, have you ever found uh, two that were mating? Um, or two that have mating, have you been able to? We're hoping with the DNA work that we can we get a handle on some of that. We haven't encountered them actually mating. I've had colleagues who have seen it in this area. And we've, we've seen males wrestling, um, not while we're tracking. No, it, we just don't have the numbers to, to make that very likely. Go back up to that time. Focus, see them built bigger. Are they just that, is that full size? Uh, this is a pretty good size. They can be a little bit bigger than this. Yes, please go ahead. Just don't touch the business. <laughs> Do they reorient through that skin? The, the, the predators. It seems like that's a little tough skin. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. So they have to have a pretty strong heart. Pretty strong teeth. Javelina. Go after. I don't know if Javelina would. They tend to be more herbivorous. Oh, sure. Do they got annual rings like a. Does. No. Please. Nothing, nothing is easy to look at. So there's no way of finding a guy in the wild. Are they cannibalistic? I wouldn't put it past them. It's not well documented. Yeah, we used to do it. Do they eat carrots? 
and reconstruction? That's a good question. They're not too fond of it. I, I don't. I don't think that's definitely not. <laughs> they don't eat. Can you touch it? You can get to eat. No, I'm going to lunch with her. So that's not what they're doing. Now, what do you These guys will get uh, chicken eggs or quail eggs or uh, small mice. There's a whole bunch of mice produced here in the med school in research. And so they will, you know, when they're killing off a pollen or a family lawn or something, they're done with it. They'll give it to us. It's a freezer full of small mice. Since what? No. So the, 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 the split between the amniotes and the amphibians is about 340 million. So mammals uh, split from reptiles since then. They don't have any, you don't want any water guys? Yeah. Yeah. Did you mention Toyota is a uh, Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's a, it's a, for type 2 diabetes. And yeah. it's, it's, a, it's very effective. Yeah, I've heard great things about it. Yeah, I started about a year ago. Okay. And it's really helpful. Maybe, but those little rabbits, they're, they're just kind of laying there. They can't they're see you. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> very... They're just they're external embryos. You know, it's not really in effect, that's right. That's right. They're, they're a lot of developing ones are born. You know, kind of like a human infant. We're, we're pretty useless at first. They can't jump at all. They can't... He can they, certainly like, climb. Like if, they climb extremely well. Him, yeah. If you let go of him now, he could get off this... He could get off the table pretty quick, but he wouldn't jump. He would run, but he would slip because of his toenails. But they can move they can run pretty quick over short distances. What they're really good at doing is whipping around sideways. So if you mess with their back leg, you know, they'll whip around and nail you on the hand. Yeah, when, uh, when they were in my garage, I could see how quickly they would move across the garage because I think he was there all night. And then I got up and, and I backed the him. car out. Yeah. And as I backed the car out, I see him walking across. So, yeah, I saw how... Is that Ninja's back legs? Oh, no, never mind. He's missing a toe. And I don't know the story about that. You know, 30 years ago, it was still pretty common to clip toes in research to identify individuals or to take tissue samples. You go back 40 years, one of the things that you were required to have in the ontology class in the 20s was to You can see this guy doesn't get to dig. He doesn't get to dig as much in the wild as would keep up with his nail growth. Right? So we actually we actually have to trim their nails. With nail that ought to be a challenge. We have to groom them. We have to groom them. It's a grad student so far, right? There you go. <laughs> So you can see it, they'll do a little more tongue flicking now. You see that forked tongue? So the same half of the snakes are just one group of very successful lizards. Hello. No, thank you. Glamour shot. So even though this is slippery and not conducive to his he can still get around. Motion, he can oh, move all okay. can. Want to reach out in the water part of him to be spat out? No, that's some of the <laughs> chair max. Watch that tongue go. Yeah. It's oh, pretty cool. Kevin, if, if, if you wanted to if you wanted to attract them to your yard, what would you do? Like you put bird seed out for birds. What would you put out for halo monsters? Have all rabbits. Lots of desert cover so that you have lots of species living there. But you can't, when you trap them, what do you use for paint? Quail what? eggs. Yeah, <laughs> you can try that. You can try that. I don't know, so they showed that trapping, that Dale, they showed the video, in yeah. the video of Dale DiNardo trapping. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many of them he actually traps and how many of them he actually just goes out and, and seeks. 
But setting up a drift fence like that is a pretty common um, lizard research strategy because it, when they're moving across the landscape, they'll hit that fence and then they gotta go left or right. And for small lizards, you just bury a five gallon bucket and they drop into it. Um, sometimes people have tried various traps for snakes. Looks like Dale's got a modified mammal trap for... But they like animals. water. Uh, they like hanging out near water, yeah, or at least so during wet times of year. A pond, or a, pool. A, pond would be, a pond would be very helpful. A pond would be helpful. Um, maybe import some quail families, maybe some rabbits. And if there are lots of quail around, there's lots of quail eggs. So is the pattern on there too? Yeah. Yep. It's kind of under the, under the skin here a little bit, but you can see all these little dots. And, uh, and so that comes off with the skin. Well, yeah. When, the on the that's right, one. that's right. So, you would almost run the supermarket scanner over it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a barcode. A binary like a barcode. code there. So is there a program that identifies them, reads their we're, markings? Yeah. We're working on that. It, the technology exists. We just haven't had the time or money to make it work specifically for these guys. Yeah, there's so much things, so many things to do. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's you right. know, I was, well, it was a great talk. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, let's give another big hand here. All right. Yeah.